So um, I'd like to welcome all of you today to uh, our Rutgers Center for State Health Policy Health Policy Webinar. The lay of the land for today is that I'll start with about a 15, 20 minute presentation on a study that we published uh, in the summer of uh, this past summer on the impact of the New Jersey COVID-19 Temporary Emergency Reciprocity Licensure Program on healthcare workforce supply. Um, I'm your host for today. My name is Anne Nguyen. I am an assistant research professor at the Center for State Health Policy here at Rutgers. Um, and uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the team that made this publication and this study possible. Um, the project team from the Rutgers Center for State Health Policy side includes Joel Cantor, Margaret Kohler, Michael Yadidia, and Julian Chow. Um, I'd like to just do a brief, you know, plug for our center. Our mission and role here is to inform, support, stimulate sound and creative state health policy in New Jersey and around the nation. Um, the center provides impartial policy analysis, research training, facilitation, and consultation on important state health policies. And one of the things that we want to continue doing is having these ongoing panel sort of discussions with the community um, to keep, you know, things moving in the right direction in, for, in terms of health policy. The work that we're presenting uh, would not have happened without the partnership with New, New Jersey's Division of Consumer Affairs, which was a, is a part of the Attorney General's office. Um, you know, key here and our moderator for today and our today's session is Magda Shaler Haynes, who's now at Columbia University, uh, and our partners there, How Howard Pine and Matthew Wetzel, who you know, made this study possible. And finally, funding from uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for that study that we're presenting, as well as this webinar. So we thank them. Um, just to acknowledge that the views expressed here in the presentation and, you know, the session today do not necessarily reflect the views of the foundation or the state of New Jersey. So uh, like I mentioned, what I want to share with you all for the first 15 to 20 minutes is the study that we published. You can find it on uh, the Health Affairs website, and the title is the same as this presentation title. So just starting off with some backgrounds that we're, that we're all on the same page, you know, what do we mean by healthcare practitioner regulation? So regulatory agencies and private entities need to ensure that a practitioner has a required training, knowledge, and experience to perform a qualified, uh, as a qualified professional in the field. So in other words, regulatory uh, regulations are important so that we can ensure high quality care for the patients that we serve. The process for healthcare practitioner regulation does vary vastly between state and that generally includes licensing, credentialing, privileging, and certification. Uh, knowing that these words are often used interchangeably, um, I wanted to first start with you know, a singular definition of what do we mean by licensing? So licensing is that formal recognition by a regulatory agency or body, body that a person has passed all the qualifications to practice that profession in the state. The requirements typically include some sort of combination of education, training, and exam to demonstrate competencies. So uh, licensing does not just include healthcare, it includes you know, almost everything under the sun, um, but for the purposes of today, we're of course talking about healthcare licensing. So um, how did COVID-19 impact practitioner regulation, uh, regulation and licensing? So the pandemic presented all of the states with a crisis that required swift action on many different issues, including the process for which we license healthcare workers. Um, temporary licensing um, or suspension of occupational licensing laws is not something that's new. It's been done before in response to other sorts of national disasters and public health emergencies. Uh, one that frequently is mentioned in this topic is Hurricane Sandy was another example of when emergency licensing was used. Most states responded to the COVID-19 outbreak by activating um, many different types of emergency response licensure laws. Um, some used existing statutes and some others took new actions. Um, over the course of the pandemic, at least 45 states uh, had enacted some form of temporary practitioner licensure waiver that would enable practitioners to work across state lines a little bit easier. 
So um, what was COVID uh, or New Jersey's response to the COVID-19 public health emergency? Well, in March of 2020, uh, the state enacted a temporary workforce provision for that included a number of different programs. Uh, among those included a temporary emergency graduate licensure program, retiree license reactivation, federally deployed providers, international medical graduate licensure, and the topic of interest for this paper today is the temporary emergency reciprocity licensure program or the Turo program for short. So the Turo program allowed out of state currently licensed healthcare practitioners who were in good standing to obtain temporary licensure to provide services to New Jersey patients using either telehealth or physically in person. And the aim of the program was to respond to pandemic related healthcare workforce demands, especially to accommodate the shortages that we were seeing at the hospital level and for underserved populations at the time. The Turtle program was made possible and enacted through an executive order number 103 that was signed by Governor Phil Murphy uh, in early March. And that order authorized the New Jersey's Division of Consumer Affairs, the DCA, uh, which is what houses licensure functions to, quote, waive, suspend, or modify any existing rule where the enforcement of the rule would be detrimental to the public welfare during the emergency. So what that actually meant was um, the order allowed licensing fees and criminal background checks to be waived for eligible applicants who are, again, in good standing. The uh, license, this executive order was uh, something that was participated by it with uh, 23 licensing entities, which included boards for physicians, nurses, and clinical psychologists, among many other professions. This uh, and graphic I have on the screen, the screen highlights some of the key program dates, uh, and I'll quickly walk you through them. So again, in March 9th of 2020, that's when the executive order was put into place. And at that time, licenses were set to expire February 28th of uh, 2021. Um, the, you know, of course, the continually evolving nature of the pandemic led to many, you know, changes to uh, what we were doing with the Turtle program. So in March of 2021, um, there was a new statement released that said that no new applications for certain underutilized groups were being accepted for the Turtle program. Um, but at the same time, licenses that were already provided were then extended to June 30th of that year. In early June of that year, uh, the new statement said that no new applications were accepted for any healthcare prof professional group uh, tied to the public health emergency termination in the state at that time. The uh, division also created two groups of healthcare practitioners, group one was extended um, until June or continued to be um, stated that they would be deactivated by June 30th for group two, which included multiple types of nurses, physicians, mental health providers, and respiratory care therapists. Uh, their licenses were extended through to September 30th. In September of that year, um, again, we were starting to see, you know, uh, increases in uh, COVID exposure and infection related to the Omicron, or sorry, the Delta peak at that time. We saw that the uh, DCA reopened new applications for group two, and those licenses were extended once again to be, uh, uh, to be expired on January 11th. Um, and in January of 2022, Group two licenses were again extended to July 1st, uh, tied to the public health emergency being reinstated in our state. Uh, moving us along to July 15th of 2022, um, the Turrell program was uh, announced to be discontinued um, and will end on August 1st for all of the groups except for respiratory care therapists. Licenses that were active at the time were um, then said to be active through to August 31st with the option to apply into a bridge program that would make any temporary licenses uh, move into a plenary uh, uh, license a little bit more seamlessly. And by plenary license, I mean more of a permanent licensure in our state. And then finally, respiratory therapists who had mentioned um, were uh, continuing to be on the Turrell program. Their licenses were said to be active 
through to March 31st of, of this current year, 2023. So a lot happened in the last in a couple years of the pandemic. And to give you some more context here, uh, when we came in to do our survey, what you'll hear about in a few minutes here is that there were about 30,000 temporary licenses uh, issued in early 2021. And, um, you know, when I checked you know, yesterday or earlier this week on how many licenses we get issued to date, they were about 53,000 temporary licenses. So this is a pretty significant number of healthcare professionals that were um, licensed to work in New Jersey, either via telehealth or in person that, you know, we'd like to learn a little bit more about. So the reason for more licensure policy research, I think, um, is at least fourfold here on the screen. Healthcare workforce supply remains a challenge in New Jersey, elsewhere, uh, New Jersey and elsewhere. This was an issue before the pandemic and continues to be an issue now. The pre-pandemic shortages were exacerbated by healthcare provider burnout, attrition, and we saw early retirement. Um, Recent studies have also shown that current workforce pipelines are not going to meet the needs, um, as uh, especially for mental health. There's a growing interest at the same time from healthcare systems, practitioners, researchers alike on the impacting, uh, impact of introducing more flexibility into state professional licensure um, processes. So um, that led to the work that you're going to hear about now, which was a study to explore who obtained the New Jersey temporary license who used that license, and what were they doing with that license. Our findings, uh, we hope, will help inform future professional licensure processes and strategies to help address the healthcare workforce shortages across the nation. So the study design for this uh, work was a cross-sectional survey. We surveyed practitioners who obtained a New Jersey temporary license between March 20th and January 6th, 2021. And at that time, it was about 31,805 individuals. The time period of that survey was January 7th uh, through the 21st of 2021. And the survey sample that we actually heard from was a little over 10,000 respondents, which was a 33% res uh, response rate. Uh, we conducted descriptive analyses by different practitioner types. And the practitioner groupings that uh, we generated include mental health providers, which included the following uh, types of providers listed on the screen, physicians, nurses, which included licensed practical nurses and registered nurses, nurse practitioners and physician assistants, respiratory care therapists, and then all else, which includes all of the practitioner types you see on the screen. So what did we find? The first question of um, who obtained a New Jersey temporary license, I just want to create some context here for some of the numbers that you'll see. The uh, you know starting pool of individuals that we uh, surveyed, that 31,805 number, this is what the distribution looked like. Among the survey respondents, we heard from about 10,000 individuals. Uh, we see a higher percentage of respondents who are mental health providers uh, than what was in the original pool. So that's something to keep in mind that mental health providers may be overrepresented in the survey response sample. And then we narr narrowed it down to those who actually told us that they use a temporary license. And that was about 7,500. So uh, our first question was, what states were uh, the respondents in the survey coming from? So when we surveyed them in January 2021, we were, you know, quite delighted to see that there were respondents coming from every state in the country, um, which is kind of a really nice thing to think about that when we issued a call for help, we saw healthcare practitioners from everywhere coming in to say that they would like to help uh, New Jersey residents. Among those states, we see that um, the top five states contributing healthcare providers were New York, Pennsylvania, Florida, Delaware, California. And the distribution and the colors that you see on the screen show that um, you know, the proportion of types of healthcare practitioners coming from each state were generally the same, um, with the mental health providers, again, represented the most in our survey population. That's why you see the biggest bar there. Um, but we see a lot of um, support coming from our, you know, states that are nearby, as well as larger states, including um, California. So who used, again, the New Jersey temporary license? 
Uh, in terms of the demographics of our respondents, I highlighted in yellow and in blue, uh, the groups that were the largest proportion of respondents. So most of our respondents are non-Hispanic, white, um, female, except for physicians where we had a slightly higher percent, uh, proportion of, of males, and then either um, mostly 40 to 59 year old, uh, years old, except for the all else group, which skewed a little bit younger. So the respondents worked mostly outside of New Jersey, which uh, signals to us that telehealth was utilized heavily by the practitioner groups highlighted in yellow on the screen. The practitioner groups that used uh, the license mostly within the state of New Jersey were the nurses and respiratory care therapists, which made sense to us, sense to us as they are uh, most likely working within the hospitals in person. How many New Jersey patients did they serve? Um, on average, the, the types of practitioners range from serving 1.4 patients among the mental health providers to recorded 409.7 patients with the respiratory care therapists. What was a significant number for us to see is that the license using respondents touched over 1.4 million lives between March 2020 and January 2021 of um, our survey date range. What share of the New Jersey patients was new to the healthcare practitioners? Uh, we were curious about you know, whether or not these practitioners were following their patients across state lines, but I actually saw that 16% of our respondents reported that every New Jersey patient that they saw were brand new to them. The highest among these respondent groups were the respiratory care therapists, nurses, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants who said that uh, most of their patients were brand new to them. 31% of our respondents reported that none of their patients were new to them. Uh, um, highest among those groups were the mental health providers, physicians, and the nurse practitioners and physician assistants um, who uh, this suggests followed their patients across state lines. What languages did they use to converse with New Jersey patients? Um, most spoke only English when conversing with their, their New Jersey patients, but what was also really significant for us to see is that the respondents reported communicating with their New Jersey patients in at least 36 different languages, including the state's 12 most common languages that are listed on the screen. And uh, in terms of the health equity standpoint, it's uh, always great to see patients get more access to patients who are uh, providers who speak their own language. What did respondents do with their temporary license? Well, we saw that 65% of them provided both COVID-related and other types of care, 29 only non-COVID-related care, and 4% were creating, uh, providing only uh, COVID care only. And how did the respondents get paid? So this was a self-reported, most of them were being paid um, by private insurance and physician, uh, pri using private insurance among the mental health providers and physicians, all else said that they were on salary um, for the most part. And then how re um, telehealth was a big question among um, our group. And we saw that uh, how often were respondents using telehealth Looking across the different um, provider groups, um, many of them were using telehealth all of the time, especially mental health providers and physicians uh, and nurse practitioners and physician assistants. It was uh, less the case for the all else nurses and respiratory care therapist groups. And then what telehealth modalities were they using? Um, and early in the pandemic, and the conversation continues now of whether um, the modality differs uh, among different practitioner groups. So in orange, you see the all audio, and in green, all video telehealth. So the um, respiratory care therapists were the group that used most audio compared to other groups, and mental health providers were the groups that, that was the group that used all video more than all the other groups. And then finally, we were curious about what did some of the, well, why did some of the respondents say that they obtained a New Jersey temporary license but not use it at all? That was about 28% of our sample. Uh, the most frequently cited reasons for not using the license was um, they could not find new patients, they could not find a job in New Jersey at the time that they got the temporary license, or they were prepared to follow existing patients to New Jersey, but then the need was not, uh, did not actually arise. Um, other reasons that they reported were personal or matters related to obtaining the temporary license. 
Uh, some quick limitations to note about the, the work that we did here is that the survey had a 33 response rate and over-representation of certain groups. So uh, we can't you know, ascertain what was going on with the uh, non-respondents. The licensure usage was also all self-reported. The cross-sectional survey was conducted in January 2021. So um, the utilization of the uh, licensure could have changed later on in the pandemic as the uh, peak shifted from our part of the country to other parts of the country. And then the program was implemented early in the pandemic when uh, it was concentrated, concentrated in a few regions, including New Jersey. So related to my last point is that um, we can only assess the time point that we were doing January 2021. Um, and if the program was actually implemented later in the pandemic, that may have changed the way that the licenses were being used. So a couple, you know, few points I want to uh, conclude from this study is that our findings suggest that the New Jersey Temporary Emergency Licensure Reciprocity Program increased the state's workforce supply during the pandemic. The um, program also may have enabled care continuity across state lines and increased the supply of services for our patients, especially for mental and behavioral health. The temporary licensure of out-of-state practitioners, along with telehealth waivers, as we saw that was heavily utilized, may be a valuable short-term solution to mitigate workforce shortages during public health emergencies, um, but long-term healthcare solutions are needed because uh, what's important to note here is that this does demonstrate a zero-sum game of practitioners moving from state to state. We're not uh, creating uh, new, new practitioners as a result of licensure waivers. Um, you know, segue into the panel presentation today is that Something that may be worth exploring as like a short-term upfront uh, mitigation strategy is multi-state licensure reciprocity. An example of that that is you know taking um, up some of the conversations recently is the interstate licensing compact. Interstate licensing compacts allow practitioners to have one multi-state license. And that allows them to practice in both their home state and in other states that are participating in the compact. Um, practitioners who have this licensure compact will be subject to the laws and regulations of the state where their patient is located. They can also work without a declaration of an emergency and um, a waiver of licensure, such as the one I just presented on. And, you know, just a quick landscape of what's going on in New Jersey. New Jersey has implemented a nurse licensure compact. It's also implemented the clinical psychology compact called the SIPACT. And it recently passed legislation for the interstate medical licensure compact for physicians. So they, um, we're excited to have panelists today talk about the implications for nurses, psychologists, and physicians uh, with regard to interstate compacts. So um, hopefully that provides some stimulating points for our panelists. And uh, I think we have a couple minutes for one or two questions if anything came in. Um, so I'll ask Joe to help me with that. Yes, and we do have a few questions. Um, so uh, Dr. Apgar asks, if while you were putting this panel together, did you consider having a social worker participate because social work is also in the process of developing a national compact? That's a fantastic question. And that's that's right, that um, social workers and along with uh, many other health professions, including professional counselors, and I know dentistry is working on interstate compacts. Um, that we would love to, you know, have more representation from different types of healthcare professionals, uh, while also having enough um, breathing room for the panelists to speak. So in the future, we'd love to have, you know, more conversation and representation across the different types of uh, practitioner groups. Wonderful. Maybe one more question. Um, yes. Yeah. So Cecile asks, has information on dentists been collected? Oh. <laughs> oh, that's a, so that, yeah, I mentioned that the, um, there's a lot of work and movement now for uh, that we've heard about that the dentists are trying to create a interstate compact as well. Um, we did not include dentistry in the survey, unfortunately. Um, they were not one of the groups participating in the temporary emergency licensure program. So um, maybe there's an opportunity here to collect similar sort of data in the future. Um, and Anne, I do believe we have time for a couple more questions. Um, sure. We have some great ones here. Um, so one of our attendees asks, um, the, on the map on slide number 18, you had NJ listed with an NP. What did that mean? 
So let me run back to that side so that we can all look at it together. And it was, sorry, this map right here. So NA, um, the temporary licensure program was designed to help uh, practitioners who maintain a primary license outside of New Jersey. So those who are already in New Jersey uh, technically did not need to apply for a New Jersey temporary license. Wonderful. Um, we have a question here from Ryan. Uh, did the majority of providers who follow their patients across state lines come from states that border New Jersey? So we saw um, that the majority came from New York and Pennsylvania. Um, we'd have to go back in to take a closer look at, you know, perhaps those couple states, including Connecticut, too. Um, to see if there was that evidence of continuity of care there. Um, so in short, I think when we were looking early on at the data that it seems to suggest yes, um, but I'd have to go back to the data to confirm that. So I'll follow up with, with them. Excellent. Um, our next question is, is there any data providing insight on how many of the respondents identified as traveling nurses licensed in other states prior to the temporary licensure implementation? No, unfortunately, we did not ask about um, whether or not the respondents were also working as traveling nurses, uh, uh, so we don't have that data. Okay, and we have one last question here. Um, what group were SLPs in? SLPs. Um, Robin, if you could clarify uh, what that acronym is, that would be great. Speech language. Uh, speech oh, language. Speech language. I believe that was in the all else category. So we had. Or if they're not listed here, perhaps they're not in our analysis. I'd have to go back to double check where if if it actually was included here, but if the list of all if if they were included, they would be in the all else category. I don't see that in the list, so perhaps it's not in our survey. All right, that's all of or our questions. Or either that or we didn't have any respondents who were um, speech therapists. Okay. Well, thank you, Joe. Of course. All right, so let me uh, stop sharing and then uh, invite our moderator, Magda, to you know get started with the panel. So uh, I'm delighted to have uh, Magda Shaler Haynes. Um, I mentioned earlier that he was an essential partner for the study that I just uh, presented um, that we co-authored together. And at the time she was a senior advisor at the Division of Consumer Affairs, but as you can see from her backdrop now, she's a professor at the Columbia Health Policy uh, Department at the Mailman School of Public Health. And so we're delighted to have her moderate the esteemed panel today. So Magda, uh, please take it away. Thanks so much, Anne. It's great to be here and wonderful to be on with this fantastic panel. Um, this was truly a partnership effort, and it just it's great to see this research come to life and to be able to be a point of discussion and hopefully to inform um, future policy needs. Very glad to be here. Um, I would like very much to introduce our panel. I'm going to ask you all to please give a little bit of background about um, your bio and what work you do currently, and also to give you a chance to respond um, to some of what Anne presented. If any thoughts occur to you, that's certainly invited at this point before we move over to some questions, which we're really hoping will be a discussion um, between, uh, between the panelists. Um, first, I would like to begin with Marshall Smith, who's the executive director of the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact Commission. If you would go ahead. Hello. Marshall. Thank you. Um, my name is Marshall Smith, and I'm the executive director with the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact Commission. We are the compact that um, helps physicians get licensed in multiple states. Um, we've seen significant growth um, over the, the number of years. New Jersey, as was mentioned, is a part of the compact. We're actively working with board staff to um, operationalize 
the process so that physicians in New Jersey can use the compact to get licensed in other states and physicians outside of New Jersey can get licensed in New Jersey. Um, one of the uh, points too about the compact is that um, during COVID, we were, I think, a very important, and the data supports this, um, answer to how do we get physicians um, in places quickly, safely, and within a regulatory um, framework that provides assurance to the public that they're being treated by a, a qualified individual. And so we saw significant growth, and I'll be happy to share some of those numbers later, but that is... Um, Liam, I've been with Compact for five years. Um, we've been in existence for five years. Um, I like to think that's a good coincidence. And um, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Thanks very much. Um, next on my screen, I see uh, Dr. Edna Cadmus. Thanks, Magda. Uh, Edna Cadmus, I'm the executive director for the New Jersey Collaborating Center for Nursing, which was a workforce center that was established in 2002 by legislation to really look at nursing data specifically. Um, we have um, been, we just released our most recent report around nursing workforce and multi-state licensure compact is one of the areas that we uh, looked at some of that data. Um, we know that there is a nursing shortage. It's not a surprise. Um, it has been really known before the pandemic and uh, continues and so, uh, looking at this type of an issue is really important, and we, you know, we'll talk about, I guess, the data as we move forward. But thank you for this invitation, and I am also a clinical professor at Rutgers School of Nursing. Thank you. And next on my screen is Dr. Peter Denigres. Thank you, uh, Magda, and thank you for the uh, invitation to to join this panel. Uh, my name is Peter Denigris. I uh, was the 2022 president of the New Jersey Psychological Association, uh, which is our state association representing psychologists throughout the state of New Jersey. Uh, in addition, I serve as managing partner of Somerset Psychological Group, uh, which is a group of private practice based in Somerville, uh, New Jersey. And uh, I'm on staff at Morristown Medical Center as well. Uh, as I'm sure everybody here knows, we have been and remain in the midst of a mental health crisis. Uh, so while mental health uh, providers had used telehealth uh, long before uh, the pandemic, we obviously saw uh, quite a, a surge in its utilization uh, during the pandemic. And uh, we're fortunate to um, have SIPAC uh, enacted um, in 2021. Thanks very much. Um, and next, Dr. Talia, please. Hi, Magda, and uh, thank you very much to you and Anne to uh, inviting me here uh, to be on this distinguished panel with my uh, colleagues in the health professions. So my day job is I'm professor and chair of family medicine and community health at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, but I've been involved with the National Board of Medical Examiners in Philadelphia for well over uh, 27 years. Uh, the uh, just a disclosure: the anything I say today is not necessarily the opinion of the national board, um, but um, but they 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 probably wouldn't be to be too offended by what I say. So uh, the organization NBME has been around since 1915, and it was founded with two primary goals: really, one to elevate the standard of qualification for the practice of medicine and surgery in the United States. Uh, and it was also um, had another goal to provide a means for recognition of qualified persons to practice in any state territory or dependency of the United States without further examination by licensing boards. As, as I'm sure people know, uh, licensure is really a state prerogative. Uh, and so um, the, the existence of the NBME really owes itself to a desire to create a loving level playing field across the states in terms of uh, qualifications. I'll stop there. Thank you all very much for those uh, those introductions. And um, you know, I'll just kick it off with some questions. There are so many hot topics in these areas, and these issues will continue to be top of mind for um, for many of us. 
because this study was conducted during the pandemic and brought a lot of the needs of the healthcare workforce to a head, um, if you have experience with interstate licensure in your respective capacities during the pandemic, can you talk a little bit about how compact professionals were utilized and um, in particular, what types of settings did they work in, um, what modalities were used um, and what types of patients did they serve in particular? And um, if you'd like to indicate if you want to answer that, that would be great. Go ahead, Marshall. Yep, so I will just jump in. Um, the compact, um, one of the things, and I'm gonna find my screen so I do it properly. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that happened with the compact is, is we, so let me back up a little bit. Compacts are designed and they're actually part of the U.S. Constitution. And, and there's a compact clause. What it does is a compact allows states to enter into agreements with each other so that they can um, facilitate act, uh, whatever activity they're choosing to do. The healthcare compacts are compacts that where states have agreed that if the practitioner, whether it's a physician or a nurse or whatever healthcare professional, if they meet the criteria to participate, they can then um, practice in those other states. For the medical compact or the physician compact, we are a bit different in that we issue licenses. Each state issues a license to the practitioner. Most of the other com healthcare compacts are what are called privileged to practice which means if you're licensed in a state that's part of the compact, you have a privilege to use that license and practice in other states. And there are various registration and, and, and processes in place to keep track of that and help states. But um, one of the things that we experienced and we kept track of, of our numbers prior to COVID occurring, and we did a 12 month survey, we were almost a one-to-one -one ratio. So each application that we received to use a, the multi-state license, one license was requested. And what we saw in looking at our physician population is it was evenly divided between physicians who were locum tenums and looking for opportunities in other states to move and get licensed. There were about a third of them were regional. They were physicians located on a boundary state and they're wanting to expand their practice into those two states. And then a third were telemedicine. When COVID hit, so uh, when COVID hit, the first 12 months of COVID, um, we had, uh, we increased prior to COVID the year before where we had 3,700 applications. COVID hit, we had 5,200, over 5,200 applications. And we issued over um, 8,000 licenses as part of the COVID process or part of that COVID period of time. And what we started to find is that we're more telemedicine physicians or physicians using telemedicine as a treatment modality started to use the compact. The, the most recent from March 2021 to February 2022, when we did surveys, we processed over 7,700 applications and there were over 13,000 licenses issued to physicians. Um, as a part of the compact process. So COVID had a significant impact on, um, on licensure and, and physician mo uh, mobility. It became a very key issue. The other kind of, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, so I don't take up too much of the time, but one of the other things that we found um, also is that a, a significant number of our physicians were getting these licenses to be able to provide treatment in underserved and rural areas. Almost, um, almost 25% of the licenses that were obtained were to assist in those areas. So the compacts, um, the physician compact, the nursing compact, all of the other compacts were a, a very important um, part of responding to COVID for all of the states. And I think that's, um, now that the crisis is over, we're, we're still filling that role. And I think it's it's still an important thing to happen. So thank you. Great, thank you. Edna, did you want to respond to that? Sure. Um, so for nursing, the regulations and systems were put in place in November of 2021. So just trying to kind of put a context to time. And uh, for nursing in the nation, there's 39 states that participate 
in the multi-state licensure uh, compact. Um, it is supported by the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, um, which help in terms of developing those regulations. Um, in New York, which is obviously one of our uh, states that are surrounding us and Pennsylvania and Ohio, um, they haven't enacted um, the multi-state licensure compact yet. Um, and actually New York has uh, some pending legislation that they're working on. So from, from our perspective, about 1% of the RNs in the state of New Jersey requested multi-state licensure. Um, and less than 1% LPN. So it's a small number because we've only had one cycle where the multi-state multi licensure compact has actually been in existence. Um, probably what was used more than anything was the temporary emergency uh, licensure uh, for, uh, for nurses, um, most specifically for students, obviously, to begin to practice so that they could get out in a much more expeditious fashion um, because we know it takes some time to get through the licensure process uh, in the state. Um, so right now, I would say many nurses still have licenses in New York and Pennsylvania um, that are single licensed and not multi-state until this, you know, until we have some movement in some of these other states around us. Okay. Dr. Sure, I can I can jump in. Um, the information um, I'm going to provide is actually very similar to what uh, Edna had just said. Um, New Jersey joined SIPAC, or it, it was implemented also in November of 2021. So we had gone through, um, you know, over a year of the pandemic, um, just doing the emergency licensure and the exemptions that um, you know the different states were doing. And those, to some extent, varied from state to state. Uh, some, you know, allowed a limited number of sessions, um, you know, via telehealth. Um, some, the the application process was very straightforward, very easy. Some states um, still required a fee um, to get licensed in their state, so it it varied. Um, once uh, SIPAC was implemented, uh, which again was just a little over a year ago. Um, I believe at the time, and I, I don't have the data from over a year ago, but there were about 20 states in the country that were part of it. Um, and in, in checking now for, for the purposes of this presentation, um, there are 33 states in the country um, where it is effective. Um, there are 35 that have enacted legislation. Um, so there are just two states that have not yet uh, implemented it. Uh, one is Rhode Island, which has a provisional date of February 1st. And then the other one is Michigan, which is uh, due to be implemented on March 31st. Uh, in addition to that, there are six other states that um, have active legislation, but it, is not, that it has not been approved yet. Uh, those include Florida, Iowa, Mississippi, Massachusetts, North Dakota, and um, similar to what Edna was saying, New York uh, as well. So uh, assuming those six um, you know, are approved and, and eventually um, implemented, we're looking at around 41 states, which is which is great. Um, you know, hopefully we'll we'll get to 50. Um, that that has been the main um, psychologist's main exposure to the interstate uh, compacts throughout the past year. Um, I would say, in terms of the settings, they've been mostly private practitioners um, who have um, joined SIPAC and um, you know used it to provide greater access uh, to care. I know we're gonna be talking about some of the benefits of this, but um, I, I would say in terms of um, the patients that they served, it would either be those seeking continuity of care, perhaps people who moved out of state or relocated uh, during the pandemic, um, even those who may have two homes. And you know, in this area of the country, it's not uncommon to know of someone who has a second home in Florida or in Maine. Um, so it, enabled um, practitioners to continue providing care to, uh, to current patients and also to reach um, new patients, you know, to again, provide that greater access. Dr. Talia? Uh, I really wasn't gonna add anything uh, to, to the conversation at this point, but um, sure. uh, there's no question that the uh, pandemic 
precipitated a lot of things, uh, including the it was sort of an accelerant for this uh, whole process of uh, interstate compacts across the health professions. Yeah, um, along those lines, hoping to hear from you all in terms of how interstate compacts can affect care quality more generally, and you know what what are the strategies to ensure high quality of care from compact professionals. Well, I can I can certainly start on that one. The the um, one of the concerns I think um, uh, sort of lurking in the background, right? We we relax things during an emergency. Um, and the question is, what, what effect on quality? There's been actually very few studies that have actually looked at uh, issues of quality, but, but uh, just to give some background, um, the um, states control medical and health professions licensure, right? And um, for the NBME, uh, in conjunction with its partner, the Federation of State Medical Licensing Boards, um, puts together, um, and also with input from the Educational Commission on Foreign Medical Graduates, has developed and administers the United States Medical Licensing Examination Series, which is the common assessment pathway for all domestic and international medical graduates. Um, but the, the training for most physicians doesn't end there. Um, most physicians now, the vast majority, um, will go on uh, to uh, residency or what we'll call post-medical school uh, training and obtain additional certification um, from a, a board, a specialty board, whether it's family medicine, surgery, or whatever. But there are still uh, a significant number of folks uh, around the country who can obtain a license uh, without additional residency training. Um, now, part of, part of the function of the USMLE, the licensing exam, is to really make sure that everybody who's applying for a licensure uh, actually has pretty much gone through that level playing field of competency assessment that the USMLE represents. Um, and you really can't obtain a licensure in the United States without that. But um, the question in my mind is what happens after that? Because there may be clinicians who have passed the examination 30 years ago and maybe never went on to additional uh, training or assessments uh, that board certification usually provides. How are they doing? Uh, and what's their quality of care? So I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions around, around particularly physician licensure um, long-term. That's been addressed by some states proposing re-licensure, um, um, but I have to tell you that the, uh, the level of enthusiasm uh, from physician organizations has been um, in negative numbers to that. But, uh, but uh, it's a question that I think, um, again, has arisen as a result of the uh, the pandemic, I'll stop there. So I guess I would just say that from a from the perspective of multi state licensure, I mean, there's very clear regulations in terms of how to apply for them. That's probably why it took us two years to figure it out within our own profession. Um, and we wanted to make sure that they were meeting their requirements. So they have to have an unencumbered license uh, in the state. I mean, the purpose of the, the board is to make sure that safety and quality are, are top of mind in terms of licensure. So I'm not so sure that I would say that there was an impact. In fact, it might be a positive impact because it helped increase the number of providers versus um, you know, what we currently have in providing. So I, you know, again, I think, you know, we were always, the truth is somewhere in the middle, right, in terms of trying to figure out, you know, what's the final outcome of all of these things, because they are all new to us. But I think that really the board is there to protect the consumer, um, not so much the practitioner, at least from a, from a nursing perspective. And, and I would add that um, I think where, and 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 it's part of the difference between um well let me let me back up 
So really, I think what the key part about the compact process, and I'm speaking primarily for the physicians, but but I know that other compacts have very similar um, uh, uh, aspects to this. Really, what the compact does, and if you'll let me use an analogy, it's like if you've ever gone to the airport and you've gone through security, there are two ways to get to through the security and get to the x-ray machine. Everybody has to go to the through the x-ray machine. Whether you're a nurse, a physician, you have to have the credentials and the license to be able to, to practice. And that, that, in a sense, is the x-ray machine. The difference, and this is where compacts, I think, have significantly impacted um, the ability for people to have access to care, is we've created a quick way to do that. So if you go to the airport again, to use that analogy, there's the long snaky line that that um, you you see families building houses and 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 setting up in those those lines, um, and it takes a long time to get it. But then you also look either to the right or the left, and you see the people with the TSA pre check. And they're expedited and they're able to get to the front of the line and into the x-ray um, quickly. That's a very rough and, and, and bad analogy, but, but in a sense, you can understand what the compacts do. They've created an expedited way for professionals who meet high bar, bright light standards um, that they can, they can get to the front of the line and they can get their license quicker. I know for the physician compact, um, physicians are able to get licenses um, once they've once they've met the qualification processes, which take about 15 to 20 days, um, they can get their licenses in seven to 10 days. Um, and that that's a very fast way to do that. And I know that that nursing and all of the others are equally as rapid. But the part about it is it's rapid, but it's still safe. It's known that physician is known. They are they are practicing in another state. They're already licensed in another state. And in a sense, for the compact, um, we have over fifteen thousand physicians that have used and are have used the compact process to get multiple licenses. Of those fifteen thousand physicians, nineteen—that's one nine—physicians have been disciplined or have lost their privilege to use the compact process. That's a very insignificant small number, which proves to us that this is this is a high bar standard. It's providing high quality care um, to the patients who are receiving care from these physicians that are getting licensed and not to discount in any way, shape or form those patients that were impacted by the, 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 the 19 physicians that ended up getting disciplined. But it's, it is a safe way to do it as opposed to reciprocity, which I think reciprocity does have its place. It is an important aspect of licensure, especially in regards to an emergency. Um, you know, in an emergency, it's all hands on deck. Um, you take care of the problem and once it's done, you, you go somewhere else. But there have been um, anecdotal um, issues and concerns raised with, um, with the reciprocity process, which is, which is a, a quick way to get someone, a practitioner there and in the state and dealing with people, the the, the same level of background, the same level of, of scrutiny of that person and there's the same level of quality are not um, are not undertaken and, and for obvious reasons. But that's where I think compacts have a very, very significant impact on the ability of states to expand um, their, their, their practitioner base. We know it, it and and have done research and we're continuing to to do this and we're we're actually launching into a deeper study of this. But we know that states that join the physician compact have on average a, a, a 10 to 15% increase in the number of licenses that they issue to physicians in their states. That's over and a you know, so if you're doing a hundred. You're, you're gonna you're gonna have 110 licenses in in a state just by joining the compact. And some of our states, especially um, uh, states with very large rural or underserved areas, those rates uh, we know from Wyoming has reported to us, and West Virginia has reported to us that they've seen a 30 to 35 percent increase in the number of physicians licensed in their state. So it does have an impact. Um, it's not the it's not the end all be all answer, but it is certainly an important tool for states to use to expand their practitioner data um, population. 
On that point, Marshall, just a, a follow up question, if you would, um, with respect to rural underserved populations like those in Wyoming and West Virginia, for example, what makes the compact license um, attractive and, you know, what's the mechanism by which you see an increase in physician licensure in those states as a result of the compact? And um, also, I saw a question from the audience uh, asking, and you did just touch on this, the difference between compact and reciprocity. And I, I hope that that uh, questioner saw their question answered or heard their question answered a moment ago. Yeah, so I I would say that that and again I don't have hard data to, to to document this, but we know anecdotally from from conversations that we've had with um, hospitals and um, the and clinics that serve rural um, populations, and I'll I'll just use one of the most common examples. So if you look at a map, you see that um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and the state of Wisconsin, the upper part of those are two to three hours away from the primary physician or physician population centers of Madison and Milwaukee. And that's where most of the physician population in those states resides. However, it's, it's a 45 minute, half hour to 45 minute drive to Minneapolis and Minnesota. And so those physicians are now been able to, and those facilities have been able to broaden their, their base by which they recruit physicians come in and practice. And most of those facilities the same is true in Wyoming and, and a lot of these Western, um, which is why the compact is very popular in Western states, is it allows for states to use their proximity to um, population centers in a different state to bring in physicians. The other thing that we've seen um, with regards to treating um, is a change in which um, centers of excellence um, like Rutgers, um, like the Mayo Clinic, like um, uh, the, um, uh, running away from me, it's in Texas, the Cancer Center, MD Anderson, what, they've changed the way in which they approach um, their treatment of, of care and uh, by using the compact to get physicians licensed where the patient is located. Before, the, the traditional way is that the patient needs the care, they come to the center, they receive their pre-treatment care, um, they go home, they come back, they receive their care, they go home, they receive their, um, and then they come back for their post-care. What, what these centers have been using the compact for is um, to get their physicians who are going to be treating that patient licensed in the state where that patient is, and now they're doing joint care with that physician's or with that patient's physician in that state. So rather than coming to the to um, that center, let's, I'm just gonna use MD Anderson. So rather than going to MD Anderson for your pre-treatment care, you're actually gonna do it in your local physician's office with the physician that's gonna be treating you, visit, uh, helping you and, and assisting and working with the physician there using telemedicine. You're gonna come to MD Anderson, receive your treatment, you're gonna go home, you're gonna do your post-care. Um, in the same manner. And so there's there are different ways that that getting licensed in multiple states has been able to impact people and and help them um, be able to do this. And um, I, I think it's it'll will continuing to find new and better ways to um, use this process. If I could comment on that, uh, Magda, that I, Marshall, I think you're absolutely right. Actually, we have we're a center. Uh, Rutgers is a center for Project Echo which actually is the uh, granddaddy of, of that uh, connection between centers of excellence and also uh, local physicians. But I, I think it's, it's problematic to conflate um, licensure with necessarily having physicians or practitioners on the ground in a particular area. I think the, the um, you know, the other, the other kind of um, Pandora's box that, uh, was opened up by the by the pandemic was uh, telehealth, and uh, telehealth has been a, you know was a godsend for for many many uh, people uh, across the uh, the uh, clinical spectrum. But but one of the things that that has sort of been not talked about a lot have been the limitations of telehealth, and I know there are, there are compacts, physician, uh, nursing that have looked at the pros and cons of telehealth. But I will say one of the things that has happened 
as a result of so many visits going to telehealth during the pandemic has been patient expectation that you can basically do everything. You can do brain surgery almost um, by telehealth. And um, unfortunately, <laughs> the you know clinical data on the physical examination information, other things are missing from telehealth. So I, I think it's it's not a slippery slope, but it's important for us to um, yes, compacts have been terrific in terms of expanding health professions um, access in different locations. But what they haven't um, really um, necessarily done is um, expanded physical geography necessarily for people being in specific areas to take care of patients. I think that's a good chance for us to talk a little bit about telehealth generally and telehealth during the both during the pandemic and certainly New Jersey, which had been a, a slow adopter of telehealth prior to the pandemic and really put the pedal to the metal during during the pandemic on that front. Um, you know, in terms of general reactions about both compacts and telehealth provision in your respective professions generally, uh, if you could talk a little bit about that, maybe Dr. Denigris, recognizing the significance of telehealth in the mental health space broadly. Good to hear from you. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, from, from our field, uh, there were two main benefits, and that was access to care and continuity of care. Um, you know, with, with respect to access, um, I think there are many different ways in which that um, was exemplified. Um, certainly people who are geographically isolated may live in rural communities. Um, there are even parts of New Jersey where there are just not an abundance of psychologists or mental health providers. Um, you know, that would be reasonably feasible for, for a person to access. So, you know, telehealth in that sense helped individuals in that situation. Um, also looking for, you know, particular specialist, um, whether um, you have somebody, for example, who's either on the autistic spectrum or um, involved in a child maltreatment case. Um, you know, my, my practice specializes in forensic psychology. So trying to find somebody with a certain specialization, um, they may not be geographically close to you. And um, having, having telehealth, again, broadened access to care for people in those populations. Um, relatedly, one thing that um, was, was discussed a lot in the media uh, victims of domestic violence who may find it difficult to physically get to um, a mental health provider um, had more options, you know, with with the use of telehealth. Um, those people who were afraid to seek treatment because of stigma, you know, unfortunately, although things are better now than they were years ago, there is still a, a stigma surrounding mental health care. Um, providing people the option to access it via telehealth uh, helped to, you know, to address that. Uh, in terms of continuity of care, you know, one of the one of the biggest things that um, I had seen in, in in my profession over the years were college students who you you establish a relationship with, and then they leave for school in a different state for three or four months, and then they can no longer see you. Um, they have to, you know, start up with somebody new or go to their their uh, college counseling center. And then they may come back for one or two appointments, you know, over winter break, and then they're gone again. So, you know, in having both, I guess, the issue of telehealth with the um, interstate compact helped to to address that. Uh, you know, we had heard a lot in the media about the great resignation during the pandemic, people resigning, starting new careers, moving to different areas of the country. Telehealth, these interstate compacts, they both um, facilitate continuity of care. If someone decides to, you know, to relocate, um, or certainly even in this area, you know, people, a lot of people live in New Jersey, work in New York. Um, now, New York's not a, a CIPAC state just yet. We're, we're working on that, but um, you know, that would facilitate, um, you know, greater continuity of care and greater access to care too. Somebody doesn't have to leave work early or go in late, um, you know, to to make an appointment. Um, you know, basically, in, in many cases, it's just ensuring that the therapeutic relationship is preserved, um, which I think in, in all healthcare professions, having that trust, that confidence in your provider, once that relationship is established, people don't want to break that and, and start anew. It's very, very difficult. Oh, 
I'm sorry, if, if I could just um, build on that also and, and kind of to address some of the questions that are coming into the, um, the Q&A, which, which I, I looked at, sorry, um, uh, Ms. Moderator. But one of the things about, um, and we know this again from our data and I'm, and I'm, and I'm looking at it. So about, uh, well, 64% of all of the physicians that obtain licenses through the compact are getting those licenses to be able to practice telemedicine, but 37% of them are getting them so that they can practice direct patient care. So there, there has been this, this imbalance, but as that's, cre as that's happening, I think one of the very important things about and I think it's oftentimes the under um, it's it's the underrealized aspect of the compacts um, that that really is the core of their strength is each state has its own set of statutes with regards to how physicians can practice medicine, how nurses can practice um, the practice of nursing, um, uh, therapists can provide therapy. Each state has a unique way in which they do that. And, and it is important to the citizens of that state that they understand that the practitioner they're talking to or they're, if they're doing telemedicine with is abiding by those standards. And all of the compacts that are, that are in existence are based on the premise that that practitioner, and I know this specifically for the physician um, compact, the, the premise is that the physician has to be licensed in the place where that patient is receiving care. And so if you're a physician, and this is where the telemedicine part comes in, if you're a physician located in Colorado, uh, which is where I'm located, and I'm not a physician, but I was treating somebody in New Jersey, I have to follow New Jersey's laws with regards to how I practice and treat that patient. Um, I can't follow Colorado's laws, even though that's where I am. I have to be licensed and practice where that, that patient is. And that's where one of the key parts, and I think one of the important parts of compacts, is it reinforces that idea that the practitioner has to be licensed where the patient is receiving care, and they have to comply with that law. And in the, you know, it's it's one of the comments that's in there too about the pro, uh, the, the, um, post uh, Roe versus Wade decision made by the Supreme Court this last year. That's that's a very emerging part of what's going on. But for physicians, they have to ensure that if the state does not pro pro provide or prohibits a certain type of um, modality of treatment for their patients, they can't do it using that license for that patient in that place. But if they if they are in a place where it is permitted and is legal, they can use their license to to do it there. And I think it's one of the key parts about compacts is the patients in a state know that the treatment they're receiving from physicians in that state are complying with that state's requirements and not some other state's requirements. Thank you. Just to um, stay with the question with respect to telehealth for a little bit longer, if anyone else wanted to comment on that and, and uh, with respect to nursing and recognizing um, both national and, and certainly statewide nursing shortages and um, the mobility of the nursing work, workforce in particular, um, would you like to comment on the telehealth? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, certainly telehealth has helped in terms of providing care. Um, nurse practitioners while they are not part of a multi-state compact, um, they certainly have the ability to use telehealth as one of the modalities, and it's been helpful across the different specialties. Same thing with registered nurses in terms of providing care. So trying to build the workforce is, you know, this is one modality that can be used. Um, and I think, you know, nursing has taken that on. Um, we really need to move to the next level within our own profession around the advanced practice nurse and multi-state licensure, but that's a national issue that has not been, you know, sorted out yet, so. Thank you. Um, with respect to one of the concerns or the leading concerns about interstate compacts generally is potential for negative effect on local market competition for um, providers that see um, that see um, professionals from out of state uh, coming in, whether by whether via telehealth or in person, 
Um, and what ways do you think interstate compacts might affect competition? And do you have a view on that with respect to both access to care um, for patients and um, patient safety? Well, it's certainly, uh, I'll speak from a nursing perspective. During the, the um, COVID um, pandemic, we certainly saw a lot of nurses leaving the hospital setting and going into travel nursing. Um, and having a multi-state compact licensure helps that process um, in terms of, of travel nursing. And that creates some instability within the, the workforce. I think we're finally starting to see some changes in that arena. Uh, now that we're seeing a slight downturn, although who knows what tomorrow will bring um, around COVID and RSV and all of the other things that we're, we're seeing, but we did see that it does create some instability in the workforce. Um, it may not be due to the multi-state licensure compact, but it certainly has, we have seen a lot of nurses go into travel nursing. I, I can speak a little bit just from a mental health standpoint. Um, I, I don't think we've had as, as much of that impact as, um, as I had mentioned. Um, I think for, for a couple of reasons. One, if someone is working with a provider out of state, as I mentioned earlier, it's most likely either somebody who they've had a relationship with previously, or um, it's a specialist, you know, which would suggest that it's somebody, a type of specialty that may not be in that person's geographic region. Um, so, and, and plus, I think the other, the other big issue is the mental health field right now is overwhelmed by the, by the demand. Um, I, I would welcome more practitioners and more providers, whether they be in state or out of state. Um, it has been extremely difficult to meet the demand that um, you know that exists right now. So our our field hasn't necessarily had um, any of the negative impacts from from this. Um, and I think those are some of the reasons why. Magda, I would I would just um, say that. Um, that uh, there's no question the compacts have expanded uh, access in a lot of different areas, um, particularly um, certain underserved geographies. But um, one of the concerns that has been arisen, not so much around competition, uh, because the United States just is, you know, uh, has a dearth of, of primary care practitioners. We're all across uh, the country and. New Jersey is in the bottom five of primary care practitioners um, from all different backgrounds per population, uh, just to give you a, you know, a local viewpoint on it. So it's really not an issue of the competition so much, but, but, but hold, focusing on primary care for just a minute, we know that primary care works well, as Peter has said, when there's a longitudinal relationship um, with the, the practitioner, whomever that might be. And it also works well when there's access to the medical record, which is sort of a background continuity piece that um, is really, really helpful in terms of, of getting to the right um, problem solving with the, with, uh, the patient. So along, as long as those caveats are met, and I think a lot of, a lot of um, states have these built into their regulations now, um, you know, the compacts might be actually an effective tool of expanding access. But, but uh, as I said earlier, uh, telehealth in particular um, um, doesn't work terribly well for physical diagnosis. Uh, and so, um, you know, there have to be understandings on the part of both practitioners as well as, as uh, patients about what works, what won't work, and what we just don't know yet in terms of might be the future. Yeah, and I would just to comment, the, the this is a question that is often raised in states that are considering um, joining the compact, that it will have a, a negative impact on the local physician population. Um, and we've the compact, uh, the physician compact's been enacted in in thirty seven states and two t the territory of Guam and the District of Columbia, and there has been no reports that it has impacted the ability of uh, a, a physician to be able to practice in a, in a locality. So I, I can understand the concern, um, but I, as several have already mentioned, I, th I think if 
if you had if New Jersey had all of the physicians that you needed and that uh, every every citizen could contact a physician and be scheduled for an appointment um, upon demand, I think that would be then an issue. But but there is a shortage and and physicians are needed in 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 every state and in every locality. So I, I don't think this while it while I understand the concern. I don't. I don't think it's been um, borne out by the practicality or the the actual implementation that's taken place. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, in a in a more general sense, just a chance for you to to reflect on how governments and health systems can work more collaboratively, more effectively, or efficiently to streamline health professional licensure broadly. Um, from from your respective vantage points, if you care to comment on that. Well, I would, I, I'm sorry, I, Magna, I would just say just as, you know, the birth of the NBME came from a desire to have competency assessments that were, uh, you know, accepted in different jurisdictions, I can see the day when the licensure compacts are, are going to pretty much be national as much as, as uh, as uh, the competency assessments uh, are. Do you have a prediction? Do you want to put a, <laughs> a, a year on that? <laughs> I would probably tell you more about the stock market than I could about when that's going to happen. So. <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to comment on that? I, I would agree. I think the most important thing is more uniformity, um, you know, among the states. In in psychology, we have a national exam that is the same no matter what state you live in, but then each state um, has additional requirements that differ, um, you know, in terms of completing the licensure process. Um, you know, when I when I was licensed, we had an oral exam. Well, New Jersey has since abolished that and added a jurisprudence exam, you know, which is different than what other states do. Um, and even the, the requirements to take the, the national exam vary from state to state. Uh, some states, you can take it pretty, pretty soon after graduation. Um, New Jersey requires an additional 3,500 hours of, of clinical work, um, which delays licensure. Um, so I, I think psychologists would advocate more, more uniformity among the states. I would just say from a nursing perspective, it takes um, a while to get your license um, and it takes too long. And that's one of the things that we're working on with our state board because the process is cumbersome and it needs to really be we looked at in terms of streamlining the, the process itself. Uh, and it's something that you know we have a concern for. Um, one of one of the things that um, we know from talking to our boards that have implemented uh, the compact is, in a sense, um, kind of, and it goes exactly to what I think everybody else has been saying is, um, you know, in a sense, the licensure is is the gateway into practice in a state, and and so a lot of the state agencies are very very careful and very diligent as they should be about letting anyone in. And so, but once they're in, um, it, it's, 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 it's oftentimes a different, uh, different game. And so they've created this process to guard the gate, if you'll let me, if you'll let me use that as, as a term. But what we found is it, it, with the physician compact um, and, and the physician compact, the way that it works is we have this expedited way that a physician gets licensed in a state. So, um, a physician that's using the compact will get a license in every single state that they wish to practice in. And that license is issued by that state. What we found in what's been reported to us by our member boards is that these physicians are a known phenomenon. They, they, can, they can then take their staff, they can actually process the applications faster because they're, they're coming in through the compact. There's a single, it's all web-based, they click on one button, all of the questions that they need to answer and the documentation they need to issue the license is there in one place. They don't have to go searching around to find, you know, where did they go to medical school? Where did they, um, where did they do their residency? All that's in one place. And so boards have found that they can do this quicker. The result of that, and, and it was truly um, 
I would like to say it was an intended result, but um, it, it what what it does though is that board staff is now freed up to deal with the more difficult state uh, cases and the cases that they're actually designed to be able to address. What about a physician who has, um, you know, uh, had had an issue or a concern or something that occurred in another state? They can now focus on that and let these. Um, I used to work with the Colorado Medical Board as their executive director, and I had a board president that called them the squeaky clean license apps, applications. So now the boards can know from a secured place that the squeaky clean applications have already been vetted. They're, they meet criteria and they can, they can move them through quicker. Um, now they can focus on what they need to do. And what we've seen in the states that have implemented the compact, that two things that one is that they're able to process, they've reduced the time that it takes to process a traditional license because that they now have the staff and the time and, and the, the effort to focus on those. So they're doing quicker. And then we also know that it reduces the cost to physicians to get licensed. We have five states that have significantly reduced the fees that they charge um, physicians to get licensed in that state because of because indirectly because of the compact process it's helped them with their staff they're more efficient it's it's increased the number of physicians licensed in the state um so all of those things so i think one of the things and and again uh please don't hear me saying that 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 we are the um unicorns and rainbows and solutions to all of the problems but but compacts are a very important tool that states can use to make their licensing process faster and more effective using these common and, and agreed to things. And I think it's important, and it's a conversation we have often with uh, legislators and with, with board staff when they've joined the compact. There's a difference between enforcing the practice of medicine in your, in your state and issuing a license for someone to practice in your state. And what we do in the compact is we focus on the license part. It's important that each state maintain their ability to govern the practice of medicine or practice of nursing or, or whatever they're 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 doing and that be completely um, separated from this licensure um, issuing process and I think that's where we can find efficiencies and become more effective and, and really have an impact and make a difference thanks we don't have much time left um, this is a great discussion I do want to highlight and uh, had planned to. Marshall, you touched on it, and we saw a couple of questions come in um, in the chat to acknowledge the overturn of Roe v. Wade and the fact that we're looking at approximately half of states where abortion care will be either outlawed or severely restricted. Um, and just to uh, acknowledge that and give some uh, space for discussion on that, I know you've uh, been doing a fair amount of thinking about that. Um, and also to point out that in New Jersey, um, certainly the legislature and governor have taken decisive action. I no longer speak uh, um, in that capacity. I'm uh, an academic now, but um, want to recognize that New Jersey has made clear that New Jersey licensed phys uh, physicians and providers shall not be disciplined solely for the provision of abortion care. Um, and um, that has been put out uh, in pretty clear language. But to the extent that we're looking at a very complicated access emergency for people across the country with respect to abortion care, um, do you want to comment um, on what, what you're seeing or anything, any thoughts on that? Yes, I will. Um, I will sally into that breach. Um, this this is one of those issues that really has highlighted, in a sense, the importance of state licensure. Um, and and I think that's that's probably the most positive way to to frame this this discussion. And I would also um, put the big caveat in there that we don't know um, what's going to happen. There are there are there are at last count, there were over 400 different pieces of legislation, either prohibiting um, and, and providing penalties and um, for performing abortion services. And there are also states that are providing shield laws and protective laws, like you mentioned that New Jersey has done. So what the compact has done, and we've actually issued a couple of, um, uh, of documents that are on our webpage about this, is go back to the basic premise of the compact, which is the physician has to be licensed and practice according to the Practice Act of the state 
and the location of where the patient is located. So um, a patient who is in living or, or uh, act, uh, in a state where um, abortion services are pro, uh, prohibited or illegal, a physician licensed to practice in that state may not perform those, those services in that state to that patient in that state. However, and this is this is where it, it really is, has become an issue and it is a legitimate concern for physicians. What if a physician is licensed in a state where abortion services are um, illegal or prevented and they are also licensed in a state where they are uh, uh, allowed and, and part of the Medical Practice Act and, and a treatment option um, that that physician can follow under the Practice Act? Under the compact and under the licensing process of the United States that we've had for physicians for um, since physicians started getting licensed in the mid 1800s, um, it means that if the patient and the physician is providing a service that is legal where they have a license to do it, and the patient is receiving that care in that location, that that physician can do that, and they should be. And and all of our legal history in this country. They are protected from doing that, um, and very much. And this is this is this is a uh, a very rough example, and I and I don't mean it uh, to discount the importance of the discussion here. But it's it's very much there is, and most people um, aren't aware of this, but there is a driver's license compact, and a driver's license compact says that you have a driver's license in a state, which means that you can drive in any other state. And you have to comply with the laws of that state when you're driving there. And that means as a, as a citizen of Colorado, which is where I'm from, I've got a Colorado driver's license. The speed limit here on the interstate is 75 miles an hour. And if I go to Wyoming, the speed limit's 85 miles an hour. And that means that when I'm in Wyoming, I can drive 85 miles an hour. And when I come home to Colorado, I don't get a ticket for driving over the speed limit. And again, I'm 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 realizing this is a very rough and and bad analogy, but it's one of the best ones that I've been able to come up with. And that's how we think. And we're the compact is positioning itself. We're positioning our member boards. We're having a lot of discussions with uh, our state, our our member boards, both those that are pre preventing this activity and those that are um, protecting their physicians that are doing it. And this is the this is where our discussion is heading. This is where we're going. That, that we need to protect and preserve each state's right to, to govern the practice of medicine in their state and the citizens <laughs> receiving care in that state. So um, there are all kinds of gray areas and nuances to all of this, but that's that's the basic premise of, of this. And I know that this impacts other um, nurse practitioners, nurses who are assisting, um, office staff, mental health, health professionals who are dealing and helping um, patients um, through the process. It, it, it's, it's got a very broad brush, but um, I think as, as, and I'll make this my final statement on it, but, but if, if people are complying with the law, um, they should be protected for that compliance. And each state has the right to establish how that practice um, occurs in their state. I, I, I think, Marshall, you summed it up very, very nicely. I mean, in addition to access to uh, abortion services, the whole issue uh, around reproductive services in general uh, vary uh, significantly from state to state in terms of age, uh, at which certain contraceptives can be can be prescribed. There's a whole host of different different uh, rules, so it it it's complex. It's Certainly, Roe v. the whole the whole decision, recent decision, has not made things any easier. Uh, if anything, has made it horrifically hard, uh, more difficult. But, but it's one of the the uh, issues around reproductive services that that really has now been exacerbated uh, in terms of what's what's been there before, in terms of what's permissible and not by different states. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. I think this conversation could go on a lot longer and it would be a great one to follow up on 
next year and even next month, given how rapidly the field is changing across uh, across professions. Um, I want to thank you very much for a very insightful conversation and for taking time from your respective very busy days. And do you want to close it out? Yeah, thank you, Masha, for moderating. This was excellent. Edna, Marshall, Al, and, and Peter, really appreciate your time here and everybody for attending. Apologies, we couldn't get to all the questions in the Q&A, but uh, this was a fantastic conversation. Keep it going. And um, we do ask that if you have a moment, uh, folks on the call, to take the um, brief survey once you close this webinar. We appreciate any feedback. And if there are any other follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to myself um, or my team here at the Rutgers Center for State Health Policy. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Wish you all a great day.